Incoming transmission. Welcome to Saving Star Trek, everybody. This week, not only am I pleased to announce that we have made contact with Vulcan Snowdub, and that explains their logic, uh, we also have a great episode for you on ice, if you get what I'm saying. Uh, this episode of Star Trek, I put in the description as Florida man wrecks his vehicle driving on ice, and his boss does not want to pay for a tow. Uh, does anybody remember the episode Breaking the Ice? Quite hello well. to everybody. Oh yes, oh yes, quite quite we well. We should should have listened. I just to watched Paul. it an hour ago, so I hopefully I should remember it. Um, all of you, we love you guys, and uh, we're not going to quit the field and leave Star Trek to to lose any ground. So welcome, all friends. The only thing that would be better is if you guys could have pizzas and beer with us. Okay, let's talk breaking the ice. We have a giant comet. And we're going to check it out for no other reason than it's there. Humans are very curious. We need to reiterate this. And space is very wondrous, lest we make any sort of mistake. This episode, I don't know that I can think of another episode it's based on. It seems like they, they just had a plain old original idea. There's no inspiration I can think Quasi of. Quasi original. Quasi. What would you say? What episodes do you see in this? Um, I, well... Another specific Star Trek episode, I don't know if I did, but ticking time clock, kind of urgency type stuff, um, we'll get into it. We'll get into it. I, I just don't... Yeah, I don't I mind the ticking clock, but I have I have two rules with the ticking clock. One, you'd better be more or less obedient to that ticking clock where you don't break my brain. It's like, we have 30 seconds, and then like 40 minutes of movie goes by. Like, I hate yes. that. Oh, I, I hate, hate that. that so much. I hate that. <laughs> I hate that. And what I also hate is, um, well, I guess I hate three things. I hate double ticking clocks. That just like, come on. Like, That's how like trophy a do you need reboot to be? type of. Uh, they always have they double ticking clocks. <laughs> but here's the thing they, mm -hmm. it gets too much for them to handle. And that leads to the third thing I hate forgetting about your ticking clock altogether and just walking away from it like it doesn't matter. And well, magically and there's, solving there's one more. There's one more that Go I ahead. can't stand with the ticking clock. And that is, uh, you have. 10 to 20 seconds left and somebody that you know is like i don't know like michael burnham just does a whole dissertation uh you know gets a whole phd in a skill that they never previously had like uh palm disarmament you know right and, and, they, and they it posts a little bit yeah and then they magically oh, very unhurried it. yeah yes. yeah yeah yes. no no realism <laughs> at all i'm thinking to myself like could you imagine star trek approaching this the planet's covered with mines it's just like I've just read a PDF file in the last four seconds due to my Vulcan discipline. I, Mikey Burnham, will disarm them all in an hour. Beam down. I will cl cleanse this planet of, of, of mines. And they're like, well, we thought this was going to be like episode last Battlefield, but looks like she's girl bossed her way through it again. What happens next? And then they're just 50 minutes of feelings in hallways. Like, in this one, like, I don't see a direct copy of anything from the past. This does, it's, it's a fairly original idea. And we have some fun with it. Uh, the snowman is fun. One of the things I think they were told was like, you've broken the idea that Star Trek is fun with way too much dark Deep Space Nine. And then like the dark, dark, dark Deep Space Nine gets followed up with like a recollapse of Voyager. So yes. for the rest of the world, they get to see like two straight years of just fucked up Star Trek. Maybe it's not bad, but it's fucked up Star Trek. It's still Star Trek today, but it's fucked up. So they, they kind of got called out by that. They're like, you know... In the depths of the recollapse of Voyager, there was like actual anger there. People were annoyed at the show mm -hmm. for recollapsing and falling back mm -hmm. into its old ways and not building on some of the things it did and the laziest of endings. And even normies, I'm not talking, you're not even talking diehard Trek fans, you know, like 
people that know the exact length of the you know 1701 down to the you know the decimeter right no the, the it, right. it's just like normal people were tuning out of that from the high mark of tng down to voyager i mean they lost a tremendous well, audience <laughs> I don't see this Enterprise episode reflecting too many other episodes. Uh, the only thing we have here is early humans have an anger problem against the Vulcans or an ego problem against the Vulcans. I'm sure T'Pol considers it an anger problem. I like the part where they come across a gigantic comet. How they hadn't been able to track it for hundreds of years beyond me. But they come across a gigantic comet and they're stunned it's out there. Um, it's like something like 80 miles across or something crazy like that. It's like the size of Long Island. And like, it's the biggest comet our people have ever seen. And it's like, so Paul's mm -hmm. like, it's unremarkable to us. You should leave it alone. And whenever she says that, you know, it's going to come back to haunt them because they told her no about right. going on to the vampire ship. Carolina cheerleaders that... <laughs> there are slightly distracting <laughs> yeah. for a second. Oh, oh you're, anyway. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, guys on the, <laughs> in the theater, we're, we're watching, uh, uh, an unnamed uh, football team, which of course will win another Super Bowl this year, and by another, there can only be one of these two. There can be only one. Uh, <laughs> I true. also, I, how was your week? I slew another Star Trek critic on top of the uh, Silver Cup Studios building. As you can see, we're up to eighteen sixty four. Thank you to all the new people who join the channel. Thanks a lot. Oh wow, wow! It's that's really, a tremendous really cool. growth. Fantastic. Yeah, very nice. I love to see it. I congratulate you guys and PDB as well as Cyrus for being there for these panels and having really good discussions because if you guys check it out, what we do is after we have to clear out of here and go on to X, we jump on with the same show we would have carried on with. We have our, our X audience and there has now been people following us there and we're here to fight for Star Trek and to prove that old Star Trek is always going to have a market. So thanks to all of you for showing up. Thanks to everyone who watched the Miri upload. My, my God, the Andorian incident, 700 views, way to go on the, on the distilled version. So the watch parties, we show you the episode. Then, um, over the course of the week, I drop a couple of uploads. They don't want people to understand that Star Trek was great, and that it is great, and it'll always be great if it's done right. And Mr. Angel, let's go with this one. Uh, it's more than we need of my best, in my personal opinion, best Star Trek ever changed my mind. I don't want to. Um, honestly, the best Star Trek ever to me is TOS, because it starts Star Trek, and it's all very high quality. And I think when we rated TOS last week, one of the things we said was, it's a C, but it's a TOS C, meaning it's better than the best A that we could ever give Deep Space Nine. And I yep. thought that that, made, that was fair and that made sense. Yeah. And yeah. as we want to say, um, we do fight to keep the memory of good Star Trek alive. There we go. Oh, we have and we have just in time, we have Cyrus. Cyrus, it's great to see you. I think what a... Wow, the transporter cycled twice. We may get two Cyruses. Uh, in a few more minutes, perhaps the evil Cyrus will show up. Or is this the evil one now? Hey, Cyrus. Not buying it. <laughs> there will never be two, because one would have to be evil. Uh, you well, know, this is the one with the beard and the mustache, so I'm going with this one's the evil one, right? You, you know, I, I just before we get into this, I do want to say one thing. I watched the uh, commercial for Section 31 that they put out. No one can stop them from putting out a commercial. I don't see how they can release it before the end of the waiting period between sales. Because it looks like it's so bad it's going to devalue Star Trek. We're going to see something that was unappreciated in its time. We're going to see an episode of Star Trek that's... It's not deeply serious. I don't know if there's any other message than to entertain... And I think I said this last week about Miri. Every once in a while, Star Trek will be will be serious, but just it doesn't need to be profound every single time. And sometimes it'll be comic. Uh, I like the framing of that shot where they had her walk away and then turn around so we could see all the goods. Yeah, I was going to say such vivid imagination. Wow, yes. It's also weird how the the belt slash band just happens to be right there. To just yeah, it's, it is kind of weird. It's, it's not As, so jo Jolene Blaylock seems to have taken this deeply seriously, in my opinion. I, I think that, like, by the time we've gotten to this episode, we're already see that she's a little bit better in the role 
She's tracking yeah. ahead of Trip as an actor. Two oh, models, yes. Trip and her. He does facial expressions better than he does dialogue. It's a good use for him. But uh, with the belt, I think Blaylock understood I... what her role on that show was. <laughs> You yeah. know what? I want to be honest here. Um, she had the ro that role on the show, but she was also able to deliver a really good acting uh, performance by the time we get to season two. And now, here we go. We're not going to sing that, it this week. That comet, I feel like, was a uh, nod to the TNG intro. Did you guys like our new Star uh, enterprise theme saving Star Trek intro? What did you think of that? Did you notice it was different this week? Oh, I did. I liked yeah. it. I liked Very it. Very nice. Now, I did also want to point out that uh, there is a line in this episode saying that Vulcans don't drink wine, but uh, I don't know if anyone here is Vulcan. I don't think any of us are, so you're more than welcome to, if local laws permit, always drink responsibly. But uh, yeah, don't let logic hold you back, folks. Well, I would like to direct everyone's attention to these uh, thumbnails and ask anybody if anyone looks, if any of these thumbnails look maybe like you might have seen it on another channel. Uh, yeah, that one. <laughs> you know what? I'm I'm cool with it, and I make. You know what? We may have just had the same good idea at the same time. You know what? G I think it's more GMTA, and I take it as affirmation because I love this for real. Sure. I I put it through the community tab. Anyone who hasn't followed this for real should. He's a great YouTuber, and it's good to have some help saving Star Trek, man. <laughs> Let's see if I can do a good job of honoring your chats while we also sum up this episode. It's a little tough, and we're under a couple of ticking... We have a ticking clock. Uh, I like Enterprise because it's like TOS, but with better special effects. I feel the same way. And really good storylines. I feel they were called out and shown some bad episodes and made to watch them again. And like they're like, you go watch Threshold! You know what I mean? I yep. generally love the relationship between DePaul and Trip. I get to like it too, honestly. Most convincing relationship in Trek history... It's the first time we really tried to do a whole all uh, love story that keeps going on. The um, this thing on the wall, the drink dispenser, is kind of like one of those uh, soda machines you have at the movie theater, where it's like the yeah, ones that can make like, any kind of Coke, including yeah. Cokes they don't make anymore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like Coca Cola with cocaine. Yeah. Add fifty dollars. The um, the the fact that they have this beautiful pie that I want to eat every time I watch this episode. Uh, I think it's great. Just shows the caliber of food that they're able to get on the ship. That uh, you know, you'd think maybe they're eating MREs or something, or you know, astronaut ice cream. No, nope. they they're eating good food. They're eating well. Yeah, they're able to recycle their poop and pee into awesome food. <laughs> yes. In that unnecessary speech that they had. Uh, Admiral, well, you have a request to put CC up on Cosme. Again, guys, they're really uncool about this. Um, they uh, they don't offer it in American. We have to watch it in English. So we please be multilingual with us. Uh, I'll rack it back thirty seconds. It's now at six minutes and thirty one seconds. Uh, it shouldn't take more than three or four hours. As the line on screen as Mayweather and Malcolm look over eagerly. Three, two, one, and action. That sounds like a good name for a band, Comet Walk. I would see Comet Walk. I feel like they put makeup to cover this guy's facial expressions up. His voice kind of portrays it. I don't think he plays half the Vulcan that uh, T'Pol does. He may have given them what they wanted. This guy hates them and her for hanging out with them and mm -hmm. is not in touch enough with himself to realize it. PDB proposed something last week, and I wonder if you guys want to speculate on this one. There's a 220, uh, there's a 200 year cultural exchange between the Vulcans and the humans from First Contact to TOS. We're right in the middle of that here. Could the Vulcans mm -hmm. have changed from contact with the humans? Be more trusting? Be less dicks? Could these? Th does this track that they, maybe they're dicks still? Yeah. Well, Paul says that Vulcans don't change. In this episode, in fact. <laughs> these Vulcans stay dicks, but 
This guy is oh, yeah. already like 170 years old, so we're only have to put up with him for just a tick of the clock on Vulcan Time War. He's he's in he's in Hell's waiting room, but uh, he he is a dick. Yeah. And uh, well, eventually, Archer Vulcans do change. We go through it in the later seasons. They got a lot of shit for this ship looking more modern, and you can almost see the Dell logo on that flat screen. Oh, I know, right? <laughs> Beautiful view of the under underside of the saucer section of the ship. At some and, point, at some meeting, someone was like, we could get Dell to underwrite the monitors, and they all looked at each other like, there are no corporations in Star Trek. And the ad guy was like, what the fuck kind of stupid show is this? So Paul's haircut looks her look like, makes her look at the fifth beetle. I think Carbon Creek, we see her with her total real hair, and then from that point on, it's just her real hair dyed black. They're trying to get 20 meters down, but yet they land higher up than in one well, of these caverns and here's here's the other thing and we're going to see this shortly this is one of the issues i have with technology in star trek which might violate one of your trek rules that will go through on x don't be okay. below ours yes exactly um i believe in in the next when they cut back to no. them he um cuts with a phaser into the ice right why don't they use the Enterprise's phasers to cut through that ice? It could do like, like say quickly. cut cut through like nine miles of it, so they only have to go nine more miles to get the trillium or whatever it's called. Right, right. Or I'm just have them cut like the three feet they need to with with the mechanical that you know didn't get weirdly messed up by the phaser blast. Right. I, Seems like there's I want to an thank easier the way. Outsider for that comment. <laughs> Once they get to the Vulcan Age, they don't give a fuck. <laughs> they are the Gen X of Trek. <laughs> Vulcans, Vulcans are the Gen X of Trek. Guess it's true. It's just like, you humans don't have Warp 5. Where we grew up, we rode bicycles in the street, unsupervised, through traffic. You will never understand the freedom. A major Vulcan disease is not cured. It ceases to occur. A Bendy syndrome when Serac being the only sufferer in the next 200 years. Yeah, although there's another Vulc there's a couple of Vulcan diseases, including they get to become addicts. They like to smoke space crack, especially to Paul. And yes. Paul looks hot when she's a space crackhead. She that is the hottest to Paul. She's got like crazy hair, and she's like, "I want more." And it's like, we yeah, don't you look great drug in that use on the, on the no, show. No, no, yes. Yes. Hey, you know what? There is no such thing as space crack, so I'm agnostic on people whether they, whether they want to use it or not. In 175 years, if you're still alive. That was kind of passive aggressive. He's trying to be a teacher and he's out of his zone. I think it's kind of good showing him awkwardly trying to relate to children. He's so grateful for that question. And he's done no prep, by the way. He's winging it like a real teacher. Yeah. Hydroponics bay with uh, three-year-olds that maintain it while they're eating the bugs. Oh, wait, no, that's just Voyager. This is a little bit of a like, an almost unnecessary question. Right. It's like, is there a lot of hot fucking going on there? Um, not I kind of really doubt a question it. you'd think from kids that young. I honestly would kind of doubt it, though. If you think about how many crew members they have and how many shifts they have to cover on the ship, I mean, are they getting any days off? I had always speculated that when we see have? Seth MacFarlane, Trip is so mean to him that they must have had a relationship at some point. They're asking where does, your our, where does the question. poop and pee go? Trip has to answer the question. Why didn't? Why do they choose to go ahead with this question? To embarrass them. You know what I think it is? We're going back to the meeting where they were like, "We don't want any more unrelatable bullshit." Because <laughs> he's talking about recycling, but he's talking about recycling the way they're going to do it for the Mars mission. But you know, it doesn't get blasted into biomatter resequences. It's a little grosser than that. Well, Ego's kicking in now. Engineer. 
But he is an engineer job. It's his job. It is his job. So what? You know, he sanitizes to Paul. He never see him complaining about that. By the way, um, do you notice that we did an Irish school and just called it an Irish school? We didn't talk about the uh, Irish reunification of 2024. And Ireland, you know, four months left. Don't make a liar of Star Trek. Now, now, of course, he's doing the uh, part out of um, Robert Picardo's book where, oh, I'm so glad you asked. Let me give you this overly long, hey. pedantic answer. <laughs> By the way, there's some stuff here no one's seen before. It's probably ill-advised to show it to children, but check it out. Right. You know what? Is this the people who wrote the show slightly expressing frustration at the way they've been forced to do this and sort of like a little like, we'll do what you want, but you mean, come on. Like, you want us to talk to our audience like they're children? We have to frame it that way. At the same time, I guess it's logical that they're huge heroes to the people on Earth. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We saved money not showing the shuttle pod trip, didn't we? We did. 2001 A Space Odyssey, I think, has sex in zero gravity, like the beginning of the book. I like this one. I think it's fun. I would say it's not profound. If you're looking for like a deep Star Trek episode, this ain't one. There's no color on this show. Um, are you? Do you mean as far? You know what? I guess I know what you mean as far as Star Trek is usually colorful, and this is a lot more muted. This was in the uh, heyday of everything has to be blue and orange, right? Yep. And also, we I guess we lucked out because the whole show was filmed in normal aspect and the new aspect ratio that we use these days. But it didn't air that way. All of it. Only the last season aired like this, if I remember correctly. So we've been looking at Paul's log because we just don't trust Vulcans and a bunch of them just showed up out of nowhere. The thing is, by the way, things have changed. This is not a tech level thing. They're far less superstitious than we are. They're like, why would she send a letter in a closed envelope? I, right. I was like, well, why wouldn't you send an encrypted message? Well, exactly. It's like, maybe she thought that you and Trip were going to fucking open it and she would have been right. And they're like confused by this. Yeah, but it, what didn't go through normal security channels, the Vulcans sent it over directly. But this looks beautiful. And this is good CGI that held up. Mm -hmm. This is a random crewman with no rank on him whatsoever. He says nothing and just walks away. That that day player was like, damn, I get to look at Jolene Blaylock because I'm supposed to be looking at the computer <laughs> panel. He was just staring right at her. Like, we need one actor that is between 6'6 six and 6'3 six and wears a size extra large shirt. You'll fit the jumpsuit. There you go, son. Guys, we're only seven episodes, eight episodes into season one. Take the journey with us. Yeah, not every actress has to be uh, seven or nine. They were too eager to make her look just like seven and nine. I also think that she suffers from the success. And look, this seems to be her real hair has that she's shown enough commitment to have a real haircut. That's really short. This is a later filming opportunity than earlier when she had parts of a wig on, isn't it? But I would say she's showing commitment to the role or she cut her hair, her real hair so short that the wig is not biased at all. People are so divided on the new Alien movie, I feel like it's worth waiting for it to stream. I Well, I'd give it a 0 out of 10 because it doesn't take place on Romulus. So why That's what are I you said. Alien Romulus when it's not on Romulus? I just turned around with a straight face and said, so they finally crossed over with Star Trek. <laughs> the deal is, he's not so much trying to act young as he's trying to act naive and overly optimistic. He's like, We'll land them inside a deep crater inside this unstable canyon, inside this unstable asteroid that's hurtling through space. Spider-Man 62, I think, has, like, the uh, evil snowman. 
It's like he's chemical slush who gets hit with electricity. Yeah, so they're blasting away. Again, why are they not using the phasers? And why go into an ice canyon to start using explosives? You know, like, I can understand if maybe they were in there, but leave your ship up top so you can get the hell out. If something, something could fall on your ship. Right. Also, there would not be sufficient gravity for the ice to fall back down like it did in that shot. Just wanted to point that out. No, you know what? They're would... not they're not making the stars move, so there is no centrifugal force. There's there would not be a tail on the comet if there was that much gravitational force. See, like how they they're trying to make him look more naive than anything else. If this was an episode of the same show, but it was William Shatner's James Kirk in the same situation, he'd be like I have been discussing the philosophy of Sarak with Sarak with your people. Um, I am quite interested in the needs of the many. Tell me more. But Archer's just like so. Like we have this sport on Amer in, on Earth called baseball, and other stuff like that. You are easily impressed. <laughs> By the way, and, and and as we say on Earth, uh, bon appetit. We're eating an enterprise. We do it every week. And, uh, yeah, they wanted to meet the Poe, but what they said was it might conflict with canon. It tied their hands if they wanted to kill off the character, which might have been expedient to the show. They didn't want it. To, no. And also, they would have had to pay. I'm sorry. It's illogical to eat before you're invited to dinner. But yet the captain did. No, he, he oh, he was insulting. afraid of their food. But why I is think he, he doing did it out of insulting? Like, it, it's illogical to me. I, I don't know. You know what? I think it's this. He can't help but seem insulting to humans because he was afraid. He was afraid. He was like, it is logical that their food will not agree with me. They eat the flesh of animals. So I will binge before I come over. So this way, if I have to eat anything, it'll only be a morsel. And then he looked at the food and it was worse than he thought. But who's ever eaten so much kale? They don't, like an hour later, say, no, I'm too full. I couldn't possibly eat any more kale. 15 commanding one ship that if your life spans 200 years that means it's like he's been in command of it for like five and a half years right but you still would think that they would rotate you on through i i think their lifespans are so long that the vulcan vulcans are like we can only go warp five it's the physical limit of the galaxy i'm going to think the humans will crack that one down the road but Warp 5 or Warp 6, whatever the Vulcans can do. They're like, that's the physical limit. Sometimes we'll be in space for a few years, but we live for 200 years, so it won't matter. Mm. So he's been the fit captain for 15 years or six trips. I don't like the delivery of that line. I like the line, but I do not like the delivery. Right. Yeah, exactly. You know what the problem was, in my opinion, just as I think about it now? I think that they were like, we have a problem here. If he's too much of a dick, he becomes a Romulan. And we don't have Romulans in this show. Ooh. You know, now See, I speak he was Vulcan. was angry when he said that. And I was like, um, okay. Well, these Vulcans are really yeah. weird. Go ahead, yeah, Jeremy. he's a racist Vulcan. Istophobic, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, we can't they, say that word on YouTube. Sorry. They but we'll be on X later using it left and right. Mm -hmm. But they really don't like the humans. Okay, so you know what? There's no centrifugal force in yet another way because Archer's just established that the comet, which is 80 miles across or something like that, or 80 kilometers across, rotates fairly slow. We got the rotation speed from them. Like, we can approximate it. So I don't understand why she's on. comfortable with trip. No, but she's he, not, but he read the letter already. Oh, that's what it is. So, but, yeah. If this was New Trek, there'd be no further causality. It would just be like, the two hot people are going to get together because they're hot. No, it, it was... But they would never allow heterosexual no, relationships. he already New knew, Trek. so limit, limit the embarrassment. That makes sense, yeah. You're right. By the way, what's unusual about this is we're seeing a Star Trek relationship. That after years of New Trek, you'd think this doesn't happen, but we're seeing a Star Trek relationship between heterosexuals. I was going to say between a man and a woman. What? Man and a woman. 
because that Star Trek sex is between yeah. one man and one woman. <laughs> she wouldn't be because love is an emotion trip. They this is where I think the writing really that, falls uh... down. The it's writing really falls thing. down in this scene. You know what? Um, yeah. We this might be the weakest one yet. <laughs> Fiona, it's a man and an alien. True. They almost managed to stick this one, because here's the thing the Vulcans have been pulling this where more developed than you. But now we find out that societally, we find out societally that the that these guys are like stuck in like Romeo and Juliet era. They have not advanced further than Shakespeare socially, though. Well, but well, not using your own maid off of any other reason would be illogical. There's That's a significant true. segment of Earth today where arranged marriages are still very common, though. T. See, yeah. I know, and I'll be Most. there next year when I hit when I when I need to get married. But that's a different story. <laughs> I just don't like their messaging here at all, and we can get into this in the review. But trips of you. This, on this one's whole actually, thing. yeah. He's he's being a human supremacist, and she's being a Vulcan supremacist, and it's just dumb. I don't understand how Florida man who never stops talking about chicken gumbo and shit like that can't understand how other people are like stuck in their ways too and like right. to hold up traditions. Right. Just like, why didn't you use the replicator trip? Ah, oh, daddy never would have let us use the old replicator. It wouldn't have seemed right. We had to go fish up them crawfish or so whatever the hell he's saying. Well, see, Phantom Outsider brings up a great point. He, he says, guys, this is a fishing expedition by T'Pol. She wants to know if Trip has any feelings for her. Well, he didn't. She didn't know he was going to read her letter, and she took steps to keep him from reading it. I think this tracks along PDB's Vulcans start to change because they're hanging out with humans a lot. But in this, this is maybe the weakest episode yet mm -hmm. in this show. All the failure analysis that they were given, they still said we're going to write a Deep Space Nine style pervert on Kira episode. We're going to use Trip as a uh, Goldicott, and we're just going to try to ship him. Here's the thing, Princess Fiona. I'm with you on this one. It's just that there's a lot of stories where T'Pol is the only Vulcan, and she acts pretty normal. It's the Vulcans, and when we get more than her in there, it starts to get horrible. Right. Um, But I agree. And it doesn't make sense that mind melds are in poor taste and considered an assault right now in the Vulcan culture. But that by the time of Spock, they're common, because that's less than half of one Vulcan lifetime. Oh no! They explained that later in the series. You think they did a good job with it? Well, I forget the explanation. They did quite a good job. Uh, Almost there. It's Almost uh, there. see. I think Mister Angel's latching onto our religious practice. You know what, Mister Angel? Respectfully disagree. I think this show is actually showing the social progress the Vulcans made. I'll give you. I'll give you that. Uh, we did say like we think that maybe part of the meta of Enterprise is that the. Uh, is that the Vulcans change from hanging out with the humans. It's just that the time frame isn't really... It's not believable to us, but we're humans. Maybe Vulcans would be like, it is logical that we all change our minds immediately. I don't know. They weren't out with explorers like the Brethren, the Romulans, so they wouldn't know what's out there. I agree. Although they do know what the Romulans are. So Paul has a pretty good idea when we see that Romulan ship. Yeah. Well, between now and TOS, it's Probably equivalent of about two generations for them. Oh, that, yeah, that's that's true. There's something. There might have been something that that letter too about how she likes me on the Enterprise. She may have been looking for a little more time. Yeah, the Vulcans. Here's the thing: we've seen some dumb Vulcans who were spies, and that almost makes sense in world because our explanation was, well, they've got to be average Vulcans. <laughs> To me, I don't think this fall would actually do significant damage to the shuttle pod. This would I do actually, like no damage. I would have preferred Mayweather jump to the controls, though, and do a couple of things where he hits some retro thrusters, and even though it still fell, he's like, I slowed it down enough to make sure we didn't get damaged. Because mm -hmm. he's supposed to be super pilot, and that's a practical and easy thing. 
It wouldn't require genius skill. That's why he's to show he was instinctive. I guess so. Now, see, they have the ticking clock, and of course, they had something to escalate the ticking clock to make you feel, you know, anxiety about the situation. Then they're going to do it again. Here's the thing, though. Like, did you like 24? I never watched it. It was only a ticking clock. <laughs> it was it. That, probably that, won't then. This show takes place between 8... Th the following takes place between 7 p.m. and 8 p.m. And there were 24 episodes a year. And here's the other thing. If they're only 18 meters down and you're in a vacuum of space, you've got no atmosphere, you know... Um, resistance or wind or anything to throw your aim off you're telling me that they can't play a video game and just shoot at this they, thing and get it like this even right bullshit. now archer could be it's like turn bullshit. on the ai turn on the ai yeah. to aim that if you can't get yeah. it yeah this is this is i'm sorry this is bullshit <laughs> see i think pdb has it best on this one we didn't have enough time in the Star Trek timeline to make it like a longer, like 200, 300 years. But I do think this show tries to say that the Vulcans improve again, as a species from contact with the humans and vice versa. Like there's a cultural exchange going on, especially ideas. And again, Not this yet, comet though. is okay. nowhere near massive enough, especially with ice and not an iron core to uh, have enough gravity that they couldn't yank the shuttle pod out. One, the shuttle pod never would have fallen. Two, uh, it would not have like been too heavy, quote unquote, for that to pull it out. Oh, no, like three, the, right? Right. right. Like, the like they make it seem like it's the magnetics. They explained that away fairly enough. But it still they wouldn't also... fall straight towards the comet. Like it. it it, it's yeah, it falls according to rules of gravity the comet shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. They're trying really hard to uh, not blow our minds with the mistakes by applying some real good music, and the performances aren't bad. But this story has flaws, they didn't work on it long enough. Yeah, uh, some of those stuff, like with the gravity, I'm sure they gloss over because it's not very photogenic. Like, if they're bouncing around all the time, A, that's expensive, and B, that tends to annoy the vast majority of an audience. By the way, I consider this a, a very failed base turn on, on the Vulcan captain's side, where he just tepidly, and in a very Vulcan way that we, we know is very Vulcan, he's like, would you like me to save your friends? Well, they said he expected him to say no, so... Captain Archer subverted his expectations. Yeah, this episode go. was stylistically designed to be that way. The shuttle pod went a bit far in a few places. Yeah, I want one of those chairs that you're sitting in. They look really comfortable. Ah, oh, he doesn't say it. Pointy. This makes no sense. Other than a feel good stick. No, Why you know what it is? She's she had the pie. She's been told a couple of times by Trip that it's really good and that she should try it. And she's like in the first couple of episodes they do an okay job of showing you that that might be the best part of the episode to be honest with you. Um like yeah. she's now willing to actually try human food, but it's it's not you know meat. She's not eating like a fucking burger. She's trying some pecan pie, I think it is, because that's what he was yeah. talking about. And here's what but should have been the theme song and might have then, saved right? Star Trek. Because you need eggs in that. Um, I guess she, you do. No, I'm. You know what? She's able to program the replicator for a vegan, uh, vegan pecan pie. It's not as good, 
Uh, it's much like regular pecan pie, but its effects are easily dispensed. <laughs> This was the worst episode yet. I don't know. Um, I guess what we do now is we go around the horn and we, uh, we we grade the episode. Cyrus sometimes takes a pass. He gets to go first. Cyrus, down to you. Do you want to give us your reactions on this episode and grade it A through Got to get the normies input, huh? That's right. The Star Cyrus Trek is here. normie. The, Honestly, Dr. McCoy of the show. this is one of the reasons why I like this show. It's modern enough where it even ages really well, in my opinion. I like the interaction between the Vulcans and the humans. Ended up not being too prideful, which was a nice thing. And nobody fell for the other person's trap. Overall, though, you still have that kind of camaraderie in the end where people were looking out for each other, which is a nice little trick thing to have, but... I still find this show more enjoyable than the other Trek shows. After Enterprise, I really don't give a shit about Star Trek. But this show, I like this show. What can I say? I think so. Cyrus, do you give, what do you give it A through F? Just so I can write this one down. I'm keeping track mm. of everyone's rating. I, it wasn't the most entertaining episode, but I'd give it like a B plus. Wow, the show's got your goodwill. Okay, so Jerm, uh, you take the stage. I've liked this episode. Uh, not a whole lot of action, but that wasn't the point of the episode. You got the info dump right. of a lot of those questions from the kids were stuff that were just floating around the fandom forever. Not major questions, but uh, they're still out there. We get developed. They were actually, yeah, they were. The there were questions that, like, Gene Roddenberry probably heard at Star Trek conventions. Definitely, yeah. There were absolutely Star Trek convention questions, now that I think about it, and now I like them better, because William Shatner once answered my question, the Star Trek convention. Chief, let me put it this way real quick before you jump to the next guy. The fact that I'm actually paying attention to this, and I was doing pretty much nothing in the background other than trying my best to listen to it, Tells you that I find it far more enjoyable than the new shit. It's well, this is a good story, and even when this show got well, this is always a good, usually a good story. We have flawed episodes. This one's pretty flawed. I still see the good story inside of it, but Jerem, continue with your assessment. Yeah, uh, we get uh, character development for T'Pol, which is good. We've needed that a little bit on trip, so we got a hint of them to developing some of the flaws like the gravity can chalk up to expense and because sometimes it's annoying for a good portion of the audience to see people bouncing around and like the shuttle pod falling at a different rate doesn't really matter and if you slow stuff down it takes people out of it this is going to be Kind of not do so great on the Star Trek Matrix. It's gonna it's gonna hit like five points mm. out of eleven, and three of them yeah. will be stuff like it's an hour long. It's good enough for regular TV. Um, I'll say this: it was fun. Vulcan Snow Dub was fucking fun. Vulcan Snow Dub was fucking funny, and the idea of the Vulcans, like they they didn't do some of the things. Was it lack of a set? We couldn't see the the Vulcan ship where the Vulcans saw the snowman. I would have given. My, I would have given something to see that. I would have liked to have seen him do that. Yeah. What? I do agree. It's the worst one so far. It is the worst. But that's one not so saying far. a lot. They're they're all up there. I gave it a B minus. Okay. So, so you and Cyrus are not a little far bit apart. Yeah, a little bit less than what the others have got, but it didn't go to a failing grade or anything like that. It's still solid. And my amazing first baseman, Resolute Germ, takes Ale Palute and chucks it over to JT Kirk over on third. JT, you're uh, the last one to go before the ball comes back home to me. Uh, what do you think? Your assessment and your grade A through F? Sure. So I think the episode starts off just fine uh, in Act 1 and Act 2. I think it falls off a cliff uh, and fails to rematerialize on the transporter pad starting in Act 3. And it 
falls apart in both stories. And look, the writers, I'm sure, thought they were clever with breaking the ice being a part of the um, the relationship between Trip and Paul, as well as literally breaking of the comet. Okay, whatever. Uh, I, I still think it's weak to put an A and B story together like this. Um, I don't think that one helped the other, which means it usually is going to drag down the episode when when the two don't build off each other quite like this. I think it does a lot of damage to the Vulcans, and I think the writers were overly preachy. Uh, we touched about it during the stream, but to me, there was no reason, one, for Trip to be so condescending of to Paul's uh, advice. Uh, and look, maybe our culture, parts of our culture, even on Earth, in the year that this show was you know, mythically supposed to take place in, might still have arranged marriages, right? Um, it, while that's not our practice in most of the West, it, it is in many other cultures. And if you're a species that has a seven year long gap in between mating, uh, maybe it makes sense that you pair up so that way you don't make bad mating decisions in a, a, such an intense hormonal primal urge to reproduce that you'll basically do anything if it gets too too far in we we, right? we need a few rules because um, you might go a few a bit too far in a few places like the guy did in the episodes of voyager mm -hmm. where they have that one fucking vulcan go through pun far yeah. and act like a dick yep. a couple of times mm -hmm. yeah we've we've yeah. seen in trek how big of a disaster that that can absolutely be so it only makes sense that maybe you have a strategy to mitigate that uh from just being a complete replicator give me the anti-pon far drugs mm -hmm. and, and, and so the <laughs> So, it, it, you know, the fact that none of that is taken into consideration, and then at the end, we get no reason why T'Pol made the choice that she did. Because her own words say that she's going to do exactly what she intends to do, and Tripp never put out a convincing argument against that. So that whole story just completely collapses, and at the end, the only thing that you can come away with is she did it because the writers want to ship trip into paul that it, that's the only reason there's no logical course of action behind it um other than you know there's going to be this shipping that that goes on later in the show so i hate that i hate that i think it's um you know it, it's daytime tv soap opera level writing um and you're taking two phenomenal characters that have been set up so far and weakening them tremendously and doing damage to the falcons of the process uh, the next step of it, I just can't forgive all of the physics mistakes um, that we already talked about with, you know, problems with the comet tail, problems with gravity in that environment. Why don't they use the phasers? There's too many mechanics of this whole episode that, yes, you're not going to get the snowman, perhaps, if they do it a different way. But you should have never been approaching it this way, and you should have been smarter about that going in. Uh, and so I, I just, I, I cannot enjoy this episode for that. Yeah, okay, we get to see a tractor beam, I believe, for the first time in this class of Vulcan ship, I believe, for the first time. But, okay, you know, that, that's We find not, out the Vulcans have a long way to go. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. These are uh, like separate but equal Vulcans. Like, we'd appreciate it if you use the special bathroom we installed for the humans. Right. So, I mean, they set up Act 1 and Act 2, and then Act 3 and 4 are just a complete disaster. By the time you get to Act 5, it's like, who cares? You know, all, there was so much damage done that I just don't see it coming away with anything than, than my final score of a D on this. Oof, I, that's, woof, woof. Let me ask you a question. If Mayweather sure. had gotten him out of there with his defiance, would it have raised the score a little bit? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, because yes. I think that like the missed opportunity here was one Mayweather to minimize the damage of the fall, and make it less dumb there because by making it at least like interesting and character building, it's like he had the common sense to vault across. Like it doesn't take great spacemanship. He just he's a fucking belter. He's been in a million different things, a boomer or yes. whatever, as they so call it in the well, show. It, you brought up belter, and I forgot to even mention that. Um, was other shows like The Expanse have no problem doing at least, I, okay, I know their physics aren't perfect either. Don't don't at me, please. But 
they at least try to give some some thought about how long it takes things to move in space, how a ship's going to move, what effect gravity has on the crew, you know, this, that, and the other, and what it does to the human body. None of that was in play here. It was like they were basically on a planet with no atmosphere. Guys, I just I so. want to address this question. Yeah, no, you're right. I want to address this question really quick. I'm sorry about that, uh, oh, no, uh, go JT. For it. Uh, John, like I would love to do a second episode and like we were committed to trying to do that. We just, we have like problems with like severe ion storms and bot storms and it's a bummer. Like, you know, no YouTuber wants to leave the field with, uh, the, the amount of wonderful people that we have watching now, but like, what can we do? Uh, YouTube is not a fair arbiter. I guess that means JT, your final grade is a D. Uh, your, yes, sir. if you could, if you could sum up everything wrong with this, uh, episode, like in one line, could you do it? top of your head this feels like voyager season five Oof, that's good enough yeah that's very illustrative um that is illustrative here we go um as a person who had been called become disengaged from star trek i uh didn't like watch a lot of the end of deep space nine or voyager in real time it's only now that i've seen stuff like that so i appreciate all the failure analysis that went into the earlier episodes but on this episode, it's just like, we have our failure analysis, but we're a little bit like scoffing at it. We're a little bit, uh, we're, 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 we're a little bit, um, you know, in a place where I love the, we got Shark Boy here. I love the place where, like, you know, like we're a little bit struggling with what we're going to do. So I think what we have here was a desire to do the episode where they have the sense of wonder uh, instilled in like space needs to be wonderful and space also needs to be dangerous. We're so tired of, of people having, you know, space, you know, problems that they solve very easily. How about having relatable problems in space? So it's like at the writer's meeting, it's like, and then we can have them do this, this, and this. And they're like, no, that's, that's kind of what we used to do. How about they fuck up and fall even further into the chasm and then chase and they ask the Vulcans for help. And we find out that they're not as bad as we thought they were. Um, I think that's what it is. And by the way, Princess Fiona, the thing about the Romulans being 1800 years before, I'd have to think about this one, but I think that the, the implication is they're already spacefaring and can go like warp 1.5. So that, that was good enough for the Romulans. They took like a multi-generational ship and split. I, that's my guess. Anyone else? Yeah, I believe that's actually consistent with beta canon. Right. The, 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 he's like, around the time that we have jesus they have Sirach, and uh he basically the rod chases all the snakes out of ireland uh, the romulans are like we'll take our warp 1.9 ships and just leave because they're a lot yeah. more advanced than us yeah sorry sir not not, not a rock i didn't want people to think yeah. that, that it sucks Dock. because we have uh, surik was... and we have Sirach, and it's so close and Sirach is spock spock's father and surik is Sirach, yes. Yes. The, or sometimes called Sirach father of vulcan uh literature uh damage to season four does the vulcans is that when we get into the uh un unconsenting mind melds and stuff like that we have about four minutes left let's uh, see if i can just run through your chats but go ahead germ you seem to know the answer season four is when they get into the uh reformation stuff where the basic oppression from the high command is basically overthrown and we start getting the Vulcans that we know in TOS. A far right. more open and far more less istophobic as they are in season one. I do think this is, yeah, this is Phantom Outsider is talking about some of the same stuff you're talking about where they realized that they would need to fix it later and there was an aspirational safety plant, safety valve built into if we go a bit too far with our Vulcans and they use it. So like, Anytime you're going to change a character, but you have damage control planned out ahead of time that works later, like you have to say, all right, it was a worthy experiment. But like, yeah, the Vulcans change pretty quick and we get to see failure analysis allegedly perfected Star Trek first. And a lot of people were saying this wasn't Star Trek when it came out. That's changed since 2000. Um, this it episode, was Star Trek. I, I always Star Trek to me refute too. that notion that it that it was somehow not Star Trek at the time. I know I know you're not asserting that it wasn't. I'm just saying the people that say that it wasn't, I I disagree. With I, them well, well, me. technically, it wasn't Star Trek until season three when they called it Star Trek Enterprise. Well, okay. <laughs> but yes, 
<laughs> he's a, a bit of in the most surely technical way. Samuel T. Cogley would be like, you know, quoting like the, the, the Martian uh federations uh like uh you know constitution or something to say why that uh we shouldn't say it, but y you're right. Um we're talking yeah, the Vulcans, if they touch like something that was once alive, it freaks them out a little bit. Which by the way, why not eat replicated meat? That's something I just realized now. Shipping Tom Wouldn't and it be Bolana ethical? helps Tom and Bolana. So the Vulcans shouldn't have any issue with it because they object for it on, on ethical or moral grounds, right? No, it's because it freaks them out to touch things that are alive because they pick up the last few feelings it had and it was being killed but to be eaten. Their touch, replicated uh, meat wouldn't have that. Right, it was never alive. Yeah. Does she relive the poop that it once was? As we found out in this episode, she's like, I, when I touch your food, I feel like a piece of shit. <laughs> well, that's because you're a telepath that feels things through touch and stuff. It's like, D -d 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 just calm down, Florida man. We'll figure this out. Uh, RRTNZ says, fair play, mate. I hear your criticisms. Having said all that, Trip to Paul is a much better relationship than Tom and Bellana. Better actors, too. Definitely. I think the, to the thing is that when Tom and Bellana get together, they have failed with those characters so much that the two of them together are perfected a little bit from what they started out with, and they are better together than they were alone. I kind of liked them more. To, the, here's the thing people like don't get. I endorse the idea that, that Voyager recollapses. What you have is a good Star Trek sandwich. Three bad seasons, two or three pretty good seasons, and another even worse season at the end. Which, like, people say they hate that they shortcut to the end. No one wanted to know any more about it. Um, but I'm getting a little bit antsy here as we get to the witching hour, so let me sum it up. This was fun. They tried to reestablish the wonderment of space. They tried to do some things to make us feel, you know, at home in, in, in the environment of the Enterprise, trying to make... Trying to like make up for that mistake, show the Enterprise is a little bit of a character. The NX01, the NX01 is still on its way. It's like you know, uh, it's, it's taking its baby steps. They're exploring because they want to explore. I always love that. I can't give it a I I can't give it an F. I can't give it a D. I can't give it a D. I'm giving this episode a, an even C. Hi, Andron. Yeah, Enterprise grows on everyone. It does. Like we bring the proof. If you don't like it. You will not be castigated for it. Uh, OT allowed for fraternization. This focus on romantic relationships is cringy. Very true. It was weird. It was This episode is the most failed one yet. I gave it a C. The thing is that there are episodes of Deep Space Nine so much worse than this. There are. And Voyager. And Voyager. There are. That are but just so each much show, worse. it's its own scale, right? Otherwise, it's true. the US it's is going to be like all A's and B's except for a couple C's and then Voyager's going to just flatline, right? So Voyager, right, that's true because the Voyager A is like a TOSC. It's like, this one was about mm -hmm. as good as the children shall eat. <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah, this was, start this is bad. we have some badly written problems here. We might have gotten out over our skis or we just, we had several really good episodes in a row to, people were thought, thought we were overly optimistic about it, but um uh honestly what they did was they just put their best team on the field for their first few weeks and now we just we they looked at these episodes they're like this story is a little weak and i'll give them uh this in the pacing of the series this was a good time for this episode uh we had to we it sounds so weird to say because she's a vulcan we had to rehumanize we had to humanize to paul we've been teeing off on her for seven episodes mm-hmm we we and it's weird that she had the hair pieces on at the beginning of the episode and and the rest of the episode she looks normal. Was the beginning the the callback? It's weird to figure it out. I don't know. There's some something went on in the productions there. A uh, cow has emotions. A steak a steak doesn't. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I don't know. Like that that was just something they put in there to make the Vulcans a little more mystical. We needed the Vulcans to have a little bit of the force. Star Trek feels like they're missing that, and Star Trek Three seems to go after it. But uh, what can I say, guys? I give it a, a C. So uh, across the board, the uh, the grades are uh, a C, a B plus from Cyrus, a B minus from Resolute Germ, JT Forever the Russian Judge gives it a D, and <laughs> I give it a C. 
Um, we love all you guys. Let's see, Admiral uh, T just made my point for me. It's all something judge. that was worse. It's never about how good it is in and of itself. Um, yeah. Uh, you know what? Yeah, yeah, it's true. Um, Ukrainian you know what? Judge, by the way. Yeah, yeah. You know, the Ukrainian judge, right from straight from yeah. Central Casting. Uh, enjoyed this uh, DS9 in the later seasons. The moment when Cisco was making his personal log, talking about sending Garrick to bomb the Romulan ship, but blame Jemadar. No, there's like, there are probably a few Deep Space Nine episodes that are better than this show ever gets, but there's so many worse Deep Space Nine episodes than this show ever gets. That's that's more mm -hmm. my point with that one. It's not a bad show, and I like Star Trek. I, I I like Enterprise and I like Deep Space Nine. It's just that like. It's not my very favorite kind of Star Trek. So I'm trying to find the way to, to cast off from uh, YouTube without casting off from uh, X because I want to do the Star Trek Matrix and other stuff like that. So I'm trying well, to I find just, that one. People were asking earlier one last thing. Uh, yeah, what you talk while I, you talk while I look at this. said on the ship right. uh, to T'Pol right before he left the captain's mess. Uh, he actually, you know, I, I put this through the translator and he actually said, cool party. Like from Batman. <laughs> that, that's uh, what he said. You well, guys talk was, amongst yourselves while I look for the escape patch. People, it, you run with me here on that. I'll be here all night. Which is Let's see. Um, the we got yeah. 11 votes in 26 minutes. And wow, RRTNZ, I can't thank you enough. In my opinion, Enterprise Season 3 does in one season what it takes DS9 four seasons to do and Voyager seven seasons to do. It's almost BSG plus Star Blazers. I got to agree to an to a, a extent. Um, I wish I could stay longer and linger on it. I'm looking for the escape hatch as we speak, but I guess I'm glad we stayed a little longer. And I'm always glad to have you guys here. The most painful thing in the world is to end a really good Star Trek uh, conversation in the middle. But, uh, you know, maybe we're moved outside where Paramount has enough money to keep attacking me with the bots. Um, my ex is Admiral underscore Teague, and I'll be there in a couple of minutes. Um, I wish I could say goodbye in a longer, more substantive way. I'm not going to back off. I didn't do Star Trek on Saturdays. We're not going to leave a Star Trek community out there and alone. And I think maybe pretty soon, if you flew with the other fleet, we're getting to a point where maybe some familiar faces might be coming to say hi and say hi to you guys again. Um, you know what, guys? Carry on. And if you want, you can follow me to X. And if you can, even if you don't listen to the uploads, liking them and just sharing them out, it helps me get the message out. YouTube sort of represses me, but the, um, the, the those 800 watchers are from the Jeff Coombs fan club. Uh, <laughs> they could show up any minute, but yeah, I, Jeff Coombs does deserve a fan club. He's only, he's, he's turning 70 on September 9th. We're going to have a Jeff Coombs, uh, we're going to have a Jeff Coombs show. So uh, I think we're going to try to find a Jeff Coombs theme saving Star Trek. We'll come on earlier. And also when we do movies, we're going to have to come on earlier because this is as late as we're going to go. We're actually, we're past goodbye time by seven minutes, but it, that wasn't so bad for James Bond. We leave out of pure fear, but first let's play the new Ent the enterprise style beginning. And then we'll play uh, a taste of Star Trek to shout out people as best we can. And we'll see you on X in about two minutes. So you can go there now if you want. Thank you, Princess Fiona, RRTNZ, who had two generous super chats. Thank you, Phantom Outsider, James Caserta. Th thank you so much. Um, thank you for coming by, and with that, we will play our Star Trek goodbye song, fresh from the punk rock mind of Admiral Teague. Incoming transmission. Goodbye, James. Phantom Outsider and Phantom Boober. And the Fed Guru Explorers, James Caserta, The Princess, Jonathan Davis. I will not back down. We will save Star Trek.
The bass player in my old band was pretty good, I gotta say. Way to go. LDG came by. RRTN said, you are the best. Thank you, man. I'm so glad we're on. We can see a lot of our friends from around the world. The amazing Mr. Angel. The amazing Orville Nation. Anyone I'm forgetting, I'm sorry. Doing my best here. We'll be on X in a moment. Gavin Blackburn. Sir, you are a scholar and a gentleman. Thank you for coming by. Um... Thank you, Tim FKJC2005, who was the first person here. And with that, I think I've made it to the beginning of the chat and shouted pretty much everyone out. I love you all. I'm going to close the poll and leave the final results. It is 18% A, 55% C, B, C, 9%. I gave it a C in my rating, a DF, 18%. There it is. And for some reason, Harris wins the poll as we translate it. RRTNZ, everybody, you, and we love you all. Come over and check us out on X, or please listen to the upload of our Star Trek conversation. We will not go quietly into the night. Goodbye, YouTube!